What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Three and Out YouTube page. I'm John Middlecoff, and we are talking football all day, every day. Make sure you subscribe, like the video, share it with your friends. Let's roll, baby. Okay, mailbag time. At John Middlecoff, Instagram. At John Middlecoff, Instagram. Fire in those DMs. Get your question answered here on the show. Mailbag question. Love the pod. As a lifelong Birds fan, me and the Eagles. Two-part question. Relating the ESPN article on Jalen and Nick's relationship and knowing, to say it nicely, you don't love Nick. I, no, I, nothing personal. This is just business. I'm just judging him as a football coach, and everyone questions his football acumen. So it's I, I, I have to question his football acumen. But he doesn't call the offense, can't call the offense. I think it's fair we just ask questions. That's all I'm doing. Seems like a nice guy. I'd have some beard with him. Do you think Jalen has earned the right to question Nick's X's and O's? He got benched at Bama and had a great season under Shane, but it's not like he's Tom Brady. I love Jalen, but that line surprised me given his background. Two, I hate the Cowboys so much. I like watching the Cowboys lose more than I like watching the Eagles win. Can you feel that Cowboy hate working in the building? When I was with the Eagles, the Giants were better. When I got there in 2010, you know, the Giants had won a Super Bowl a couple years before than they won it a year later. So the Cowboys teams, I think Wade Phillips was a coach when I first got there. Then maybe Garrett took over a year two. They, they just weren't as good. So it was it's probably different than it would feel right now that the Cowboys and the Eagles have been kind of fighting out for the division. I, I would say the Giants felt more like the big bad wolf in the division and the hatred that rivalry was stronger than uh, the Cowboys. Obviously it's a huge game because the team, the brand, the rivalry, but it, it, I felt the giants were a bigger deal and it has to do with how the teams were playing. I do think when you look at Jalen, Jalen was benched for a guy that went fifth in the draft. Now we can argue about Tua, but Tua was a better college player and they benched him. Jalen had a transfer. One guy goes in the second round. The other guy went five. So I, that's just pretty basic football. You just play guys who are better at the time. Two, Jalen played, and Colin and I talked about this, for Nick Saban. I, I'm pretty sure Dayball was there one of the years. Maybe he missed him, but Lane, Sark, Lincoln Riley. So, like, he's been around pretty awesome offensive coordinators and offensive minds, and then Shane. So I think there's one thing of questioning. If you want to push back on Jalen, like Jalen, we don't want you to be a pure pocket quarterback. You're not Tom Brady or Peyton Manning. That, that's completely fair. But like I think he kind of knows what it looks like in terms of being coached from a schematic standpoint of guys who are pretty brilliant. So I, I think questioning... I think whenever you question someone, if you're right, like even if your resume might not be as long as them. I mean, there are people probably all over America who have been working middle management jobs or management jobs who aren't very good. And people under them think that guy is a complete slap. Complete, unknowing, unknowledgeable fraud. Like That happens all over corporate America. It happens in football too. And... Obviously, Nick has qualities, the leadership that people like, I guess. Players like him. But I, I don't think it's crazy that Jalen questions his football knowledge. Even if on some of it, he might be right. Assuming he's arguing like, we need you to scramble more than play in the pocket. Love the podcast. I came across it two years ago, and since then, I've listened to every show. I even went back last summer and listened to all your old shows. God, I like this guy. Even the one where you had Howie Roseman on. The Rosenberg show was probably my favorite episode you've ever done. I'm a huge Howie Roseman guy and Eagles fan. My question is, if you were an NFL owner and you could start a franchise with an, any NFL GM, who would you choose? It's a good question. Uh, what I would do is I have a specific individual uh, probably for the Chiefs who I would hire. Obviously, it's not Veach because I can't, but th there's a guy on that staff that I would hire. Now, what I would do is I would hire a guy like, I mean, 
if I was an NFL GM and you had any juice in the hiring, you would go, here is the budget I need for these two positions. Because these are really, really important. I guess if you could start an NFL franchise. So, okay. So let's just assume I'm the owner. I know exactly who I'd hire to be my GM, but I would pay a premium for a guy like Jake to run my cap and the business aspect. And he would obviously work hand in hand with my GM in the sense because the money aspect of the team is such a big deal. But I would lean like on a brilliant, brilliant scout buddy that I know. I think there's a couple I'd feel pretty comfortable hiring. Uh, And I I understand what Jake's saying, and I I value that position a lot. So I would would try to bridge the two. I I am obviously biased because I I know people that have been on Super Bowl teams, and I, I would just, everything they've ever steered me when it comes to picking players is just right. Now, obviously, he's right about, you know, you are not taught how to manage a $250 million budget. But, I mean, some of these guys have been pretty high-level guys for a long time. Listen, I, I've heard great things about Joe Douglas, and you look, it looks like he's over his head. I mean, he went all in on Zach Wilson, this Reddick situation, and P- I know a bunch of guys that worked for him in Philly and love the guy. But it's kind of embarrassing what's happened to him in New York. No way around it. I mean, he is a very well-respected guy in the league. Bald guy. Chubby guy, I root, I root for him just because us bald guys, you know, we kind of stick together uh, even when we don't know each other. But it's kind of embarrassing what's going down. As a Chiefs fan, I think our division will be tougher this year. Looking at the other teams, I still think they are a year or two out of being playoff contenders. Both Colin and you have been on record saying you see the Chargers and Broncos making the playoffs or Broncos making the playoffs. I don't see three AFC West teams making it. I would agree. (laughs) Three AFC West teams are not going to make it. I'm not going to throw away my Chargers take, but their margin for error with a couple players is really small. I mean, they got three guys that they need to be elite. The quarterback who's injured, Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa. Joey Bosa's currently injured and Khalil gets banged up. So it, it could be tough sledding. Now, even if it's tough sledding, it will not look like Brandon Staley. And they will be as competitive as any eight-win team you'll see in the league. But it could be challenging. I wonder if the Broncos are a little better than we think. What if their quarterback's just plug-and-play ready? Obviously, he's a rookie. He'd have some bad games. But is it inconceivable to think, like, they got some big-ass wide receivers? You don't need Walter Payton on your team at running back in 2024. You can piecemeal that thing together with three or four. They got offensive linemen. I'm not the biggest McGlinchey guy for $50 million guaranteed, but he sure started on a lot of winning teams in San Francisco. Defense is a little bit of a question mark, but what if offensively the Broncos actually are pretty good? I don't know if I pick it to make the playoffs. Like Both those teams could be pretty similar. Eight, nine wins, but problems. Love the podcast. Congrats to you and Maria. I've been thinking about a crazy hypothetical. What if there was a pre-playoff draft where ringless veteran players on non-playoff teams could declare and each team could draft one player from the other conference? The players could join for the playoff run before returning to their original teams the next season. Similar to loans in international soccer. For playoff teams, it might help them out if in an event of a late-season injury. Players could benefit too. We might get less guys like Calvin Johnson or Joe Thomas retiring without a ring. Thoughts? I like this idea. (laughs) And if the owners would ever allow it, my vote would be cool. But the reason they would never allow it is because if I own the Lions and I got Calvin Johnson and, you know, he's been retired now for a while and the money's changed, but let's just say the equivalent of 2024, I'm on an awful team but I have this sweet player. I am paying him, Calvin Johnson, to be a $30 million wide receiver. I'm paying him almost $2 million a week for 17 weeks, and I've given him $100 million guaranteed. What if he shatters his leg in the second round of the playoffs for the Chiefs 
or for the Ravens or for the Bengals. What happens to me? <laughs> then he just comes back to me and it's not my problem. So there would be no risk on the playoff side, right? If you're one of the good teams drafting these players and all the financial risk for the other team. So that guy plays more games, gets injured. Does that still go in my books? What if he shatters his leg, can never play again, and I just sign him to a huge contract? Essentially saying that's why it, it would never happen. Though, like your idea, like you thinking outside the box. Throw another shrimp on the barbie. Get in all the UFC 305 action live from the land down under at DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of the UFC. The middleweight title's on the line for the main event, but the card is stacked full of rip snorter blokes and shellas. And speaking of stacked, if you're new to DraftKings, listen up. New customers get five bucks to get 150 in bonus bets instantly. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use the code John. That's code John for new customers to get 150 in bonus bets when you bet just five bucks. UFC 305. It's going to be a ripper of a good time. Only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. Jags fan here. And I'm wondering what the hell Doug's fascination is with Press Taylor. If you recall, Doug, Doug wanting to promote Press to OC in Philly is part of the reason he was fired. I don't think he was wanting to promote him. I think he kind of did, and he didn't want to fire him. If I remember correctly, it's been a while now. Once Doug got the job in Jacksonville, he hired Press as the OC, but he didn't call plays. And then they had success and were one of the best offenses in football while having a fairly average personnel group. The next season, roughly two hours before the Jags played their week one game against the Colts, Jags PR announced that Press would now be calling plays for the offense. The switch didn't really work as the offense went from top 10 in most categories to middle of the pack in passing at the very bottom in rushing. Shad Khan, the owner, has publicly stated multiple times that he wants Doug to call the offense. Reports are that Trevor has said the same thing. Why is Doug willing to gamble his head coaching career on this guy? At any point in time in your life, you need someone who is above you to believe in you. Even like Jeff Bezos or Sergey and his partner at Google needed someone with money to buy into what they were doing, right? As a player, you need a coach early on to believe in you. As an assistant coach, you need a head coach to believe in you. And for whatever reason, Doug loves this guy. I mean, Doug views this guy like Mike Holmgren in the mid-90s at the Packers viewed Mariucci, Gruden, and Andy. He thinks this guy is a star. And let's face it, when you believe in a human, and I would say a lot of us at different points in time in our life will either be in a position or have been in a position where you just believe in a guy. You're like, I believe in this guy. I think this guy is going to be really good at whatever he's doing. And in public jobs, like he's going to be a quote-unquote star, coaching star, uh, you know, some great artist if you're in the music business. Could just be in sales. Like you got this young intern, like we need this guy can make us a lot of money. We need to double down on this guy. Sometimes you're wrong for whatever. It doesn't mean like you just miss something. Sometimes you just like the individual. That's the hard part about business, right? You can really like someone. Your values can align. Maybe you see politically the world the same. Maybe your morals are the same. Maybe the way you view family is the same. So you're like, I have so, like, I really, we connect, but that person is not good enough. And I think sometimes the personal connection can cloud what you believe or know of that guy's tangible talent at whatever he's doing. And I'm with you. It, I also think this is an easy fix. If I'm Shad Khan, I go, listen, Doug, I'm not going to meddle here. In general, like I let you and Trent do whatever you need to do. Sign whoever you want to sign this guy. I'll give you the money. You want to trade this guy. You want to hire this coach. But I hired you because years ago, I watched you out duel Belichick in the fucking Super Bowl with Nick 
Bulls. I want you to call the plays. I don't think that's a crazy ask. You became the most famous coach in Eagles history because you led them to a Super Bowl. You won a Super Bowl before even Andy Reid won a Super Bowl. I need to call plays. And I don't think that's too crazy if you're Shad Khan to demand that. Like, I don't even think it's demanding. I think you just do it. I like Doug, and I, I don't know Press Taylor at all. Uh, I Clearly, I think he's, people think he's a nice guy, good guy. I think it's fair to question him as a coach. How many games of Deshaun Watson, Watson struggling until Cleveland, Brook Park, I guess that's where their new stadium's going to be, have to consider sitting him down? This roster is complete and ready to compete. Honestly, the only question mark is on him. I believe he will struggle, but the money he's being paid, can they actually bench him? Have you heard any rumors about Washington name change? Obviously not going back to the old name, but Commanders just doesn't feel right. I personally liked Washington football team. Totally agree. I, I never understood why they changed Washington football team. It just worked. I think the Watson thing's hard. And this, like the previous question with Doug, is this an owner decision? Like, hey guys, I did this, I want this, and I want to make it work. The thing if you're the coach and ultimately want to go with a change, if he's really terrible, like you have a lot of body of work now. You've had a lot, I guess he's only started 12 games, but he's been on your team for a while. And I, I read today, he's fully cleared, he's completely healthy. There is a lot of pressure on this guy to play well. If I told you right now, Josh Allen was the Browns quarterback. Is it safe to say they would be the betting favorite to win the Super Bowl? I mean, if they had a top five quarterback on their team, I think they would be the betting favorite to win the Super Bowl. But they have a guy who's been objectively awful. John, that you're being too... No, he's had one good half. I think it was against the Ravens. Other than that, he was really bad. And then this offseason, what did they decide to do? They found some of the Flacco. <clears throat> Worked with the scheme, worked with their players. Fantastic backup. Cost less than $5 million. They didn't resign him. Why? Because they're not dumb. What's the first thing the fan base would do if he throws three picks against the Cowboys week one and you lose? 24 to 17. Put in Flacco. We want to make the playoffs. Can't do that with Jameis Winston. Because we've seen Jameis. I mean, he's not as good as Joe Flacco. So I think the team, the front office, slash the owner, made a conscious effort to basically clear out the decks for Deshaun. But that means all the pressure's on him to play well. He's got a longer leash, but how ugly can it get? I, I don't I don't have the answer to that. But I, I don't expect it to go great. I don't think he's any good. I don't know if he just lost his confidence. He doesn't even remotely look like the same guy. The guy hasn't played that much football since sitting out the year, all the masseuses, the injuries. It's been a disaster. It's It's been legal robbery. That's what Mulgetta and Deshaun did to DeHaslam. Legal robbery. Because they've robbed the Browns. Which, listen, if it's legal, do it. What do you think is the floor ceiling for the Rams this season? I would say the ceiling would be win the division and compete for the NFC. Um, they have a huge, huge hole in Aaron Donald, who was the heartbeat of the defense and really the heartbeat of the team. He's one of the best players in the history of the league. So I, I give the Rams credit for doubling down on the two Florida State guys. Derek Ray, who's been on this podcast, who's the GM at Florida State. Obviously, Jared Verse, a really good player. McVay, during the preseason game, was calling him a stud, loves him. I mean, he's, he's a good player. He'd play for everybody in the league. The D-tackle they took, that, that viral video of Verse calling him, I don't know if Derek said this on the podcast, but he told me off it, he, he, and he's Derek's a big Raider fan. He's like, he, he, his motor and his energy for football is like Max Crosby. I mean, he's one of the super tryhard guy. And listen, I started watching uh, the Pete Rose documentary on HBO. I don't think we talk enough about 
you know, Max Crosby, Pete Rose, those guys are not the most talented guys. Like Pete Rose became one of the greatest baseball players ever. And he'd be the first to tell you, like, I wasn't even remotely the most talented guy on my own team. There were three or four guys who had more God-given ability than me. Effort. And I, I think this kind of works for any walk of life. Working hard, getting there early, doing everything humanly possible. In athletics, you can feel it more because you're like running around, moving around. In basketball, it's like, keep cutting. You know, in baseball, it's like, run to first. Uh, in, in football, it's just like, 100% effort till the whistle. In in life, it's different for us because if you have a desk job, you're not like sweating while you're doing it, but you can go above and beyond. And even if you're not the t- most talented, even if you're not the smartest or the brightest individual in the operation, it's pretty hard to fail if you max out effort. And that's the way he described this player to me. Now, there's a difference of like max effort guy and Aaron Donald, who had elite talent and was max effort. So I would say their floor would be, I mean, if Stafford misses any time, they're done. If Stafford misses any time, they got no shot. Stetson Bennett is terrible. I don't even think he's an NFL player. Honestly, I would not have him on. If I ran an NFL team, he would not be on my NFL roster. And Jimmy Garoppolo, who I think has suspended the first two games for some PED use, the guy we saw with the Raiders looked like a lost puppy. And he was like that, you know, he just feels like he's lost it. Feels like he's just lost. And I think sometimes when it goes, it goes hard. And I, I don't expect much different now. He does know LaFleur, Mike LaFleur, who's now, you know, working for McVay. So maybe he can kind of get him on the straight and narrow because Josh McDaniels, who he also knew, I've never seen Jimmy play that bad in his life. I mean, he looked like a USFL player. So if that's your backup quarterback, that version... I don't think you can win games. And clearly, they're just... Stafford stays healthy. Puka and Cooper are healthy. Like, they're going to be good. I mean, <laughs> McVay's a stud. The defense, you would think, would be pretty solid. They got a lot of young talent. I mean, we know they can score points. I, I would be pretty high on them. But Stafford goes down. Like, other... Like, the 49ers. I think they could win some games with their backup quarterback. I don't even think it's possible with the Rams. Uh, Just a nice note. Appreciate it. Pete Rose documentary is funny, man. Pete, until they showed it on the screen, because he wears like this flat bill hat, he wears like the Robert Kraft, you know, white collar, blue shirt, but he untucks it and it's really big. Those shirt, if you're going to w- rock that shirt, the white collar, which feels like a little out of style, uh, more like 10, 15, 20 years ago, you have to tuck it in because those shirts, especially if you're buying it off the rack, are never, you know, I, I own some untucked shirts that, you know, are perfect, right? You can wear them untucked. Those are not made to wear untucked. So he walks around. He just looks like your classic. I, I thought Pete was like, I don't know, 70. And then you realize, well, he broke into the big leagues in the 60s. He shows he's 81 years old. He's dying his hair. He got caught gambling and just refused to tell the truth. Refused to tell the truth. Just, I don't know in the history of sports we've ever seen higher highs and lower lows. I mean, the guy became a legend, a champion. Um, own some of the most heralded stats in the history of a game based on stats and then get banned for life. <laughs> I mean, banned for life is not allowed in the Hall of Fame because he lied. Shows you, you know, your parents tell you when you're young, just tell the truth. And you're like, I don't want to tell the truth. I'm going to get in a lot of trouble. Then the older you get, you realize you didn't kill anybody. Just, just tell the truth, take your medicine, and it'll be over faster when you lie. It always is worse. And Pete, you know, as he said in that documentary, he's like, my lawyers told me they're never going to be able to prove it ever. And then the Major League Baseball, the attorney they got to look into the situation and basically do all the due diligence for them to figure out what was going on. I forget who it was, like Paul Giamatti's dad, who was the commissioner at the time, was like, we hired a lawyer who literally was taking down the mob. This wasn't going to be that difficult for him. 
and they figured out everything that Pete Rose actually did. And then they told him in the sit down, Pete Rose like realized I'm caught red handed. Then they showed Pete's buddies who got arrested, who were involved in the gambling. It's crazy. When you look back, it's like gambling and weed things like that. I grew up on that were so taboo. It's like, what are you talking about? But all the gambling guys from like the eighties or seventies all look the same, all look like lower level mob guys. They all have on the jumpsuits. They all have on the aviators. Just a, they look straight out of central casting in a movie, and they were all Pete's boys. I honestly, my takeaway: if you're betting on your team to win, betting on your team to lose, clearly banned for life. You should go to jail. Bet your team to win. I I understand why you can't do it. But it's not that crazy. You, you you're literally betting on your team to win. I don't know. It's your job. You, you your life is depending on a team winning if that's the business you're in. So putting some cash on the side, I think Phil Mickelson once did that on the Ryder Cup and he lost because they lost. It, it doesn't bother me as much. I get it. It's never going to be, you know, normalized. But now, I think a lot of people go, are we sure he never bet on a team to lose when he knew some shitty ass pitcher was rolling out and they had no shot playing, you know, a team that's rolling with their ace and they're rolling their dude from double A out. And you go, no, he's too competitive. But anytime, you know, you start gambling, I don't know. I wouldn't put it past him. That's all. So I, I, I kind of get both sides. Just sad story though. Al Michaels and him used to be buddies. He, he He's in it. It's just an easy watch. It's, it's an easy watch. Different time too. And I, I was watching it with Maria. And she's like, God, it's just simpler times. I'm like, I don't think you realize how famous all these guys were like baseball players in Pete Rose's era were the equivalent of like Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, the Watts, the Bosa's like how big of a deal these players were like Johnny bench, Pete Rose. When he first got to the big leagues, Mickey Mantle was making fun of him in a preseason game. Like how famous these guys were in the sixties and seventies. When I moved to the Bay, Vita blue uh, used to work out in my gym. RIP. Like that, that guy was a rock star in the seventies. He's the equivalent of like an NFL quarterback. Different times. Baseball, just the brawls they used to get in just look like, just look fun. And <laughs> sometimes I miss only thing I miss whenever you look back at like times before you were born, it's like, God, if I would have known what I would know now. It would have been a real estate maven tycoon. You're like, no, you wouldn't have. Cause you wouldn't have actually known. But it would have been cool to watch sports in the 70s, like the Steelers and Raiders games in the mid-70s, or, you know, the the Reds playing the A's in the World Series. Would have been fun. Or Wilt and Bill Russell going at it. Hey, John, big fan. I'm on the road a lot for my job, so I appreciate the work. My question is more of a hot take, and I wanted to get your thoughts. Shanahan is the most overrated head coach in the NFL. He is brilliant. He's a brilliant offensive mind, but absolutely terrible when it comes to game management and crucial moments. I've heard you mention in a lot of your pods that all he wants to do is run the ball, yet in the biggest games of his career, he's elected to go pass happy at the absolute wrong time. Both Super Bowls. I think he used the Atlanta Super Bowl, and then I think this last Super Bowl. He's using Roman numerals. I, I, I'm i not up to date on my Roman numerals, so I, I, I have no clue, but I think he's choosing Atlanta because he used L-I and then live, which I think was last year. Then in this year's Super Bowl, so maybe he was using the first two, and then this year, okay, trying to keep up here. Then this year, he made the big mistake of giving Mahomes four downs in overtime. It's little things like that that make me wonder if he'll ever win the big one, as Super Bowls are often decided by a crucial play or a coaching decision down the stretch. P.S. This is coming from a Falcons fan. I talked about this on the podcast when Sean McVay hired the dude. I think it's hard to be a master at everything. And when you're calling plays on that given week, you are trying to master your own team on offense and the opponent. You are do, stri- simply doing more than the CEO head coach. And Andy Reid was talked about in a very similar vein as the way you just described, Kyle. Can't manage. And maybe it's through experience. He's obviously gotten a lot better at it. It is still difficult. 
I do think you need someone to help you out with that stuff. Now, part of having that someone, like Sean McVay's got John Stryker. Is he going to listen to him? Because I think the 49ers would say, we have a guy. He chimes into Kyle's ear, and Kyle doesn't always listen. So Sean McVay, the the, the ego, the belief in yourself, sometimes you just got to relinquish a little juice, and you can't micromanage everything. And I give McVay credit for making that hire. Like, why didn't Kyle hire this guy? That'd be my question. Why weren't the 49ers all over this guy? What are the Rams offering him? 500 grand? Why don't you offer him 750? That's just a line item for your operation. Rams are offering him 800 grand? Offer him 1.5. Because his value, if that's the difference of winning an extra playoff game or winning the Super Bowl, what's that worth to you? Honestly, what's that worth to you? I'm a big Lions fan, but also still a Stafford fan, even though he doesn't play for my squad. Although I like Goff and think he's done a great job, I do believe Sta- Stafford is more talented. You are correct. Stafford is more talented. Do you think that if Stafford was never traded with this roster and coaching staff, the Lions would have won the Super Bowl in 23 or even 22? Or do you think that the trade was needed to get the picks and players required to be in the building blocks of for the team. And if Stafford was still here, the team wouldn't be where it is now. Well, when you traded Stafford for Goff, that first year you went 3-13, and 13, if memory serves me correct. You probably win a couple more games with him. And that led you to Aiden Hutchinson, who I think is going to be one of the better pass rushers in the league for the next seven, eight years. Then the following year, that trade, because Stafford got hurt, gave you the sixth pick. And that led to a running back that looks like Alvin Kamara meets Christian McCaffrey and Sam Laporta. So that trade, in a weird way, it's hard to do this because there are so many variables, but I think it's safe to say that there's a decent chance that you would not have Hutchinson or either the running back or Laporta. And I know there are other, you know, aspects of it, but if you just look at it in a vacuum like that, and part of the reason why everyone's so high on you right now is because your offensive weaponry and Jared Goff, here's the difference. Stafford's better than Goff if they're both healthy. No one would argue that. If you if the teams are the same, you would take Matt Stafford over Jared Goff. But if you can load your team up like the Lions did, and insert Jared Goff, who's like, what, ninth best quarterback? What's Stafford? Fifth? Sixth? The gap ain't that wide, and you're in position. Now, if you just put Matt Stafford in that game in the second half against the 49ers, do you have a better chance to win? Yeah, I think that's fair to say. But like you said, that's not really how it works. So I think part of trading him was what you had to do. You know, forever the Oakland A's, because they the owner's so cheap and just they don't make any money, would always trade sweet players like Hudson, Mulder, Zito, or Yoenis Cespedes, whoever the group was. They, they would trade them all. And then a couple years later, they would have the new version of those guys. And I, I think that's ultimately what Stafford did for you. You traded him, his value was still really high because the Niners and Rams both really wanted him. And I I think you guys deserve a lot of credit because you essentially chose the deals were the same. Do you want two first round picks and Jimmy Garoppolo or two first round picks and Jared Goff? And I think at the time of the trade, a lot of people like you want Jared Goff. And it was 100% the right move. Honestly, it's a pretty legendary trade. Now looking back, It, it really is. Doesn't top Ryan Poles and everything he got for the Bears, but saved your franchise. 